<clears throat> Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Jenny Ferry for facilitating this entire trip and to Michael Brownlee and his assistant Beth Miller for facilitating through Local Food Shift. That great moral philosopher and sometime pugilist Mike Tyson is... <laughs> Most people don't start their climate change talks this way. I don't know why. Mike Tyson, my favorite line of Mike Tyson's, admittedly it's a small group of words to choose from, my favorite line is, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> Through industrial civilization, we've been punched in the face. We have punched the planet in the face, and in response, the planet has punched back. We face near-term human extinction as a result of climate chaos, as a result of environmental catastrophe, as a result of nuclear Armageddon. I'm just going to talk about one of those today. I propose to talk about just climate change to a, a group of 7th through 12th graders earlier today. And the teacher and organizer thought that was a little too dire. So we agreed that I would talk about three paths to near-term human extinction instead. And I'm not sure how that was all that much better. <laughs> there were tears. But it was, an, it was an amazing experience meeting with those young people today. I was the one crying, of course, not them. They're tougher than that. Climate chaos is well underway. This is a series of assessments conducted by large organizations. As we go down the page, the predictions become increasingly catastrophic. They're based on more data and more sophisticated modeling as we go down the page. So by the time we get to the United Nations Environment Program from nearly three years ago, a long time since between major assessments, up to 5C by 2050. We haven't had human beings on this planet at 3.5 degrees C above baseline. So 3.5C, 4C is almost certainly a death sentence for all human beings on the planet. It's not because it's, it'll be a warmer planet, it's because the warming of the planet will remove all habitat for human beings. Ultimately, we're human animals. Like other animals, we need habitat to survive, and that habitat must include food. So without plankton in the ocean, there goes roughly half of the global food supply, because that's the base of the marine food chain. Without land plants associated with temperature extremes, cold and warm, the ability to lose land plants is growing rapidly. And there goes the other half of the food supply for human beings. If we have up to 5C by 2050, that'll certainly do the trick. The US, U.S. Department of Defense finally gets on board, and in their latest assessment, which just came out about two weeks ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concludes that global warming is irreversible without massive geoengineering. This is among the most conservative scientific bodies on the planet. And they admit that we have triggered runaway greenhouse unless we do some massive geoengineering. They don't propose what kind of massive geoengineering because none have been attempted. No geoengineering strategies have been attempted at the necessary scale. So this sounds relatively dire to me coming from this organization. The relatively good news is that these assessments do not include collapse. The bad news is they don't include the positive feedbacks or self-reinforcing feedback loops. When you roll a ball on flat land, the ball, because of friction, tends to stop. When you kick the ball over a hill, the ball goes faster. As it goes down the hill, it picks up speed. That's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. We've triggered 25 of those. None are included in any of these assessments, including that latest assessment from a couple of weeks ago by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that recommends geoengineering. I say the good news is that they don't include collapse and collapse is underway. However, after thinking about that for a while, many years, I finally concluded that that's no good news either because what collapse means is, well, the good news associated with collapse is that it's no food at the grocery stores, no fuel at the filling station, and no water coming out of the municipal taps. That would be the good news. The bad news is that means that the world's 400 and some nuclear power plants melt down catastrophically in a short period of time. 
Currently, Fukushima represents a major threat to humanity. If the spent fuel rods, which are scheduled to be moved by that wholly incompetent organization, TEPCO, Tokyo um, Electrical Company, Power Company, if, if they fail in moving those spent fuel rods next month, according to nuclear researcher Chris, Christine Consola, if one of those MOX fuel rods is exposed to the air, one, of the 1,231, it will kill 2.89 billion people on the planet in a matter of weeks. So nuclear catastrophe is right there on the horizon, but that's bad news, really, really bad, compared to what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm just going to talk about bad news instead of really, really bad news, because, you know, I'm such an upbeat kind of guy. If we talk about those positive feedbacks, and I'll go through a list shortly, Paul Beckwith considers those in an interview he did just over a year ago and concludes we could face a six degrees C temperature increase within a decade. And indeed, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper from about a week, a week ago finds a 5C rise during a span of only 13 years based largely on methane release into the atmosphere. So we're not talking about 25 feedbacks, we're talking about one or maybe two at that time self-reinforcing feedback loops. And as pointed out about five months ago in science, climate change is on track to occur 10 times faster than any time during the last 65 million years. So things are really starting to get heated up. We're in the death spiral, and things are looking particularly bad in the near term. Planetary scientists thought for the entire existence of planetary science that Earth was right in the middle of the habitable zone. Based on the size of our sun, there in the upper left, we, were, we thought we were at the perfect distance from the sun to be in the middle of the habitable zone. And you can see that as of March of this year, with a paper that came out in the astrophysics literature, we find that, in fact, Earth is right on the inner edge of the habitable zone. It's actually within 1% of habitability. So human habitation is provided at 280 parts per million carbon dioxide and 700 parts per billion methane. But the methane level today is two and a half times that, and the carbon dioxide levels are at 400 parts per million, plus or minus five, for the first time in human history for the first time, in fact, in more than 3.2 million years. So it looks like we were at the inner edge of the habitability zone. Venus, by the way, is approximately equal distance in towards the sun as Earth is from Mars. And Venus's atmosphere was stripped away. It's too hot. It looks like because of the environmental chemistry that we have changed in our atmosphere, that we have managed to push ourselves out of the habitable zone in the relatively near term. <clears throat> You've probably heard the classic denier report that climate has stabilized in the last 15 years. In fact, the warmest year on record remains 1998. But all of that is based on land records, based on the instrumental record from land. We know that the heat has been coming still, that the atmosphere is warm, that we've triggered a greenhouse effect that is greater than at any time during human history. Where is it all going? Well, as was discovered earlier this year, March of this year, the global average temperature when we go beyond those surface records, land surface records, and look into the ocean, especially the deep ocean, temperature increase has accelerated in the last 15 years. We haven't noticed because we have the thermometers in the wrong place. Three quarters of the globe is water, after all. If you're only measuring the quarter of the globe, you might miss something. And in fact, we did for a long time. Among the, among the uh, 23 irreversible self-reinforcing feedback loops is this one. This is the first one that was reported in the scientific literature, reported in March 2010 in Science. 
Methane hydrates or clathrates are leaking out of the Arctic Ocean. These are cages surrounding methane molecules. And as the ocean warms, they rise to the surface and the cage falls off and the methane is released into the atmosphere. Methane in the short term, meaning less than 20 years, is 100 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So it's a big, big deal. Over a 100 year period, methane is only about 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So we have 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, approximately. We have 1,800 parts per billion methane in the atmosphere. And apparently, we have triggered this self-reinforcing feedback loop reported from more than three years ago in the Arctic Ocean. Just the methane hydrates beneath the Arctic Ocean account for somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 gigatons equivalent of carbon. In 2010, as of March 2010, we'd released 225 gigatons by burning fossil fuels of carbon. We're burning about 30 to 35 gigatons a year, so we're up over 250 gigatons now. But still, that pales in comparison to the carbon equivalent of releasing methane from the Arctic alone. A 50 gigaton burp of methane is highly possible at any time, according to a paper in Nature from a couple of months ago. That's equivalent to more than 1,000 gigatons of carbon, more than four times what we've released so far. So it's perfectly plausible that we could see a 6C temperature increase within a decade. It could happen at any time. In fact, through NASA's CARVE project, observations last summer included methane plumes up to 150 kilometers across in the Arctic Ocean. This is huge. You're up there in a ship and you see the ocean bubbling in what looks like ginger ale, 150 kilometers across. And that's methane leaking out of the Arctic Ocean, pouring out of the Arctic Ocean. Four more self-reinforcing feedback loops were reported in the referee journal literature in 2011, after that one in 2010. Six more were reported in 2012. Six more were reported through the first half of 2013. Six more to date in 2013. Twelve self-reinforcing feedback loops in 2013 alone. We're seeing geological events play out in real time. The acceleration is fully underway. There are two of these feedbacks that are reversible at temporal spans relevant to the human experience. We could stop these if we had the will. We could stop drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic. Now that it's open, though, why not? Suddenly it becomes low-hanging fruit. Fortunately, Shell Oil Company sent their two big rigs, the only two rigs capable of, going, of, of handling those waters in 2012. So they went up there in August 2012 when the approval was fast-tracked. And as it turns out, sometimes nature bats last. So the equipment was destroyed. And it will take them at least until 2014, at least until next summer, before they have them ready to go out and start drilling in the deep sea in the Arctic again. And if there's a buck to be saved, we'll save it with the vaunted Northwest Passage that is finally open for the first time in civilization's history. <clears throat> Malcolm, Wright, Malcolm Light, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group in 2012, concluded based on data from NOAA and NASA that methane release had gone exponential. And as a consequence, he did a significant analysis that concluded extinction by mid-century. Subsequently, however, NASA and NOAA removed a handful of data points. They smoothed and revised the data. And so it appeared that Malcolm Light was jump on the gun a little bit, that his analysis of extinction by mid-century was based on data points that were subsequently removed from the data set. However, subsequently, we have seen those methane plumes up to 150 kilometers across this summer from those 
methane hydrates in the Arctic Ocean. Again, equivalent to a tremendous amount of carbon. And so he might have been a, a little bit ahead of the game, but I think it was only a little bit. And when Malcolm Light was writing about extinction by Ben Century, he was talking about methane release accelerating exponentially, releasing huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere and leading to the demise of all life on Earth, not just human extinction, by the middle of the century. And he pegs the date at 2031, plus or minus 13 years in the Northern Hemisphere. And 2047, plus or minus a similar number of years in the Southern, southern Hemisphere. And that makes sense because the Northern Hemisphere has a much higher land to water ratio than the Southern Hemisphere does. If you want to persist through climate chaos a little bit longer, the Southern Hemisphere is the place to be. There's almost no land there. So there's a huge ameliorating impact of the marine environment. The United Nations Environment Program, they're actually their advisory group on greenhouse gases in 1990, 1990 warned us that we could expect rapid, unpredictable, and nonlinear responses that could lead to extensive ecosystem damage. Once we hit the one degree mark, we're at 0.85 degrees. And these self-reinforcing feedback loops we've triggered, the 23 irreversible ones, show great evidence that the United Nations Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases was conservative in their 1990 assessment. It didn't take one degree to trigger what appears to be runaway greenhouse. In fact, John Davies, writing for the Arctic Methane Emergency Group on September 20th of this year, concluded just looking at CO2 alone, not including methane, not including any of the self-reinforcing feedback loops that I've, that I've already put up on the, on the screen here, just including carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, John Davies concludes that by 2040, there will be habitat for relatively few humans on Earth. That's not taking into account any of the feedbacks. This assessment is taking into account one of the 25 self-reinforcing feedback loops we've triggered. So the question is, now what? Especially if you're a penguin, because you're about to run out of habitat there. I always like to check in the ping with the penguins, see what they're thinking. It used to be the voices in my head. Now it's the penguins in my head. Actually, I put this slide up here so I can breathe a little bit, remind myself that it's all going to be, oh, it's not going to be okay, is it? So now what? Well, quoting another great moral philosopher, the boss, in the end, what you don't surrender, well, the world just strips away. It turns out we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet with no consequences. It doesn't work that way. So it's time to let go of our expectations that humans are immortal. You know, if you, if you look at life on Earth, for example, if you consider the age of Earth, 4.6 billion years, and we'll call that my, my wingspan. What, what part of that is life on Earth? It's the last few cells on the end of my middle finger. Let's extend that life on Earth. That's the wingspan now. How long is the human experience? That's the last few cells on the end of my finger. All species go extinct. We're about as special as the bacteria in the Petri dish. More special than some because we've known what was coming for a long time. In 1847, 1847, George Perkins Marsh, naturalist and ambassador, a combination you hardly ever hear about these days, naturalist and ambassador, George Perkins Marsh, in 1847 predicted that if we burn fossil fuels, we're going to warm up the atmosphere. A half a century later, Svente Arrhenius, in April of 1896, wrote a paper predicting that if we keep burning fossil fuels, we're going to experience a one degree centigrade temperature increase as global average in about 2000. 104 years in advance, he missed by 0.15 degrees. Not bad. We've had warnings for a while. In 1987, the undersecretary for the Navy said that 
if we, sorry, this is 1986, said that if we keep burning fossil fuels, we could expect human extinction within a few decades. A few decades later, and what do you know, we're there. Thanks to Alex Jones for pointing that out to me. It's kind of a funny thing. Somebody sent me this article by Alex Jones in which he was saying, look, these crazies predicted human extinction within a few decades in 1986, and here we are a few decades later, and we're all doing fine. I'm not sure how he defines a few decades, but I'm not sure we're there yet. A few, that might be five decades instead of three. People keep asking me, when, when are we going to be able to tell? When is it going to affect me? When is it going to be too hot when I go outside that I won't be able to hoe my garden? And like, okay, when are we going to be able to tell? Let's see, the last time, you know, in theory, every month has a 50% chance of being below average temperature, right? Every month, if we measure the monthly average temperature, has, has the potential to be below, a 50% chance of being below average and 50% chance of being slightly above average. So in theory, about every other month should be below average. The last time we had a below average temperature month at the global level was February, 1985. Some people in this room weren't alive the last time we had a, a, a month in which it was below average temperature. The odds of that happening, by the way, are greater than the odds against plucking a single atom from the entire universe. There's somewhere between 10 to the 80th and 10 to 100th atoms in the entire universe. 2 to the 339th power is a bigger number than that. So in the absence of global warming, that just basically can't happen. Okay. I give very little advice when I speak. I, I think I only do one or two pieces of advice, but it's, I, I feel like I should do more, so I give the same piece of advice four different ways. So the boss is just really mirroring ben, Zen Buddhism, right? Let go or be dragged, or in popular culture, carpe diem. When I speak on college campuses, students say I'm, I'm mispronouncing that. It's crappy diem. It's a really <laughs> shitty day after they hear me speak. College kids. Or from Nietzsche, live as though the day were here. And to which I would add the wise of that actual philosopher from 2,300 years earlier, Hippocrates, first do no harm. There's more. <clears throat> There's more to revel in. We're the lucky ones because we get to die. I mentioned there were somewhere between 10 to the 80th and 10 to 100th atoms in the universe. The odds against the collection of DNA being found in physical form in your body far exceeds that. So the odds against any one of us being here far exceed the odds against plucking a single atom from the entire universe. And yet, here we are. We get to die. And that means we get to live. That doesn't happen to almost any collection of DNA in the history of the world ever. It's pretty amazing. Evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins points out, in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here, privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why. It's incredible. It's almost unbelievable. If I believed in miracles, we'd each be one. Earth is in hospice. How do we react to that? A lot of people react this way. In fact, you can probably name names, right? A few come to mind for me. They work for Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase. And on and on the list goes. There are people who know and there's a lot of people who accumulate wealth by accumulating information. And many of these people have known for a very long time that the carbon dioxide and the methane we release into the atmosphere doesn't show up in terms of temperatures for three or four decades. So the changes we're seeing now were locked in three or four decades ago. Changes we see in three or four decades 
happen as a result of what we do today. There's a huge lag between our actions today and the consequences down the road in terms of the Earth's planetary systems. Now that Earth is in hospice, and all of us are in hospice, I think that points us, at least it points me, towards a way that we might want to live. Instead of pursuing glitter, pursuing gold, pursuing material possessions, accumulating stuff, what I see in hospice is people acting with compassion and giving things away. What I see in hospice is people who are not looking for another pair of shoes. Instead, they're looking for somebody they can help. What I see in hospice is people acting with a kind of empathy, compassion, kindness, and courage that we are all capable of exhibiting. That when we look through history for heroic individuals, we look at those characteristics. That's what I see in hospice. So the other little piece of advice that I give to people is to pursue what they love. Instead of pursuing what culture tells you to do, right, go to college, get the engineering degree, go to graduate school, make money, blah, blah, blah. Instead of pursuing those things that culture is screaming at you to do, why don't you instead pursue what you love? It's interesting, when I meet people for the first time, <clears throat> they almost always ask, what do you do? Right? That's what people do in this culture. Hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. What do you do? By which they mean, how do you make money? Because that's what we do in this country, is we make money. So people ask me what I do, and I say, I milk goats. In fact, that hand you just shook, that one, that one right there, that was in the birth canal of a goat not that long ago. You might want to wash your hands. I'm a homesteader and a sharecropper and a writer and a speaker and apparently a real Debbie Downer at parties. <laughs> and then I say, what do you love? And if they haven't run away by that time, they're like, holy shit. What is this guy doing? He's asking these questions. Nobody likes that question. What do you love? We don't ask that question. Another thing I encourage people to do is pursue a life of excellence, whatever that means for you. Socrates pursued a life of excellence that lasted 70 full years. And all he did was ask questions. In fact, he just asked the same six questions over and over and over until they got tired of asking those questions, so they killed him. <laughs> we should be so lucky, right? We should be so lucky as to ask questions so persistently that it so pisses off the powers that be, they just kill us. What a way to go. He just asked six questions. What is courage? What is good? What is justice? What is moderation? What is piety? What is virtue? He just kept asking. Everybody he ran into. Sometimes Socrates would be walking, to the extent he wasn't just a figment of Plato's imagination, apparently he'd be walking along and he'd have a thought and he'd just stand there for hours working through that thought in his mind. I heard that story and I thought, really? He's in his 60s and he, he can stand there that long without eating or peeing? That's impressive. There's no accounting for the stuff that's going to come out of my mouth when I get up here. I had this, this presentation of 89 slides. A, an hour and a half ago, I had 89 slides. And I'm talking to Jenny, and Jenny says, ah, that's too many. So I said, okay, so here's what we'll do. I'll send you that file, and we'll put it on your computer, and I'll have these notes, and I'll take out almost all of them and just have like 20 slides. And so that's what I'm showing you. And she has the notes on her computer. Where the hell did that go? Oh, that's right. It broke. So I'm just winging it here. That's why there's no accounting for what's coming out of my mouth. She thought I was a professional, and I know what I was talking about. <laughs> People are funny. <laughs> People despair when they hear what I have to say, oddly. And, and so I respond with Edward Abbey's quote from 40, 30, 40 years ago, action is the antidote to despair. Even if, especially if, we're all doomed, let's act. If you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, then do. 
let's do, you've known since you were 10, maybe 12, right, that you're going to die? We've, all of us in here have known this for quite a while. This is not some revelation. I'm not the first person to remind you, probably. But it's nice to get the reminder now and then that you're going to die. And so that maybe you should live as though the day were here. It's amazing what culture drives us to do, contrary to our humanity. So let's exhibit some humanity. Let's act. Action is the antidote to despair. Even if the action is hopeless, geez, it gives you something to do. You know, even if you live to be a hundred, it's nothing. Right? It's the blink of an eye. And, and when, you're, when you're in your deathbed and you're 70 or 80 or 90 years old, you remember a few things. And not just because you're 70 or 80 or 90 years old. But because those memories are moments. The things we remember are moments. We don't remember whole days. You're not going to walk out of here and remember a third of what I said. You're going to remember moments. And some of those moments are going to stick with you for years and even decades. So let's create those moments. Those moments that we want to remember. Those moments that make us proud to be us. That, that make us rise above our petty selves and become what we're truly capable of becoming as human beings. Let's create those moments, no matter how few they are. If you want to know more, and why wouldn't you want to, I write at many different places. Um, Nature Bias Last is where I write most frequently and most prolifically. That's GuyMcPherson.com. I write a monthly essay for Transition Voice and have since they were created about four years ago. And my latest endeavor is to work with two other teachers and homesteaders to help people prepare for an ambiguous future at beyondreskilling.org. My latest book is just out. I haven't, haven't even seen a copy. I don't even know what it looks like. It might suck, really. It wouldn't surprise me at all. It's called Going Dark. In my first 10 books, I was really quite optimistic. I'm over that. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But no, I was a completely different human being a year and a half ago. And I'm not so optimistic anymore. So the latest book, which includes a pretty comprehensive assessment of the straits we're in, is just out. I had ordered a bunch of copies to be rushed here, and they couldn't get them rushed in time. So if you go to my website, guymcpherson.com, you can find out more information. If you want to order, so if you want to spend your pursuits, your last days, <laughs> reading shit like this, knock yourself out. Really. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right. I think, I think Jenny had something she wanted to announce. Is that true? Should I do questions first? Why don't we do some questions? All right. Why don't we do some questions? Questions, anybody? Comments? Answers are particularly welcome at this point in time. <laughs> I would love to hear some answers. You have an answer right there. Yes. When I first started, I told Jenny, because I didn't have my notes, I was going to do the deer in the headlights thing, but I waited until, until, until just now. I don't know. I share property with a 10-year-old. And, and I speak tomorrow, tomorrow? Friday. Friday. Friday, I'm speaking to fourth and fifth graders at the Montessori school. Yeah, no, it's, I'm not that bad. You think I'm going to walk in with a machine gun and say, you're all going to die? See, I told you so. No. Have a little faith in me, woman. Jeez. I don't know at what point children become old enough to absorb these messages. When, and I suspect it depends upon the child. I've interacted with people who have, well, a woman who hosted me last year about this time in western Massachusetts had a five-year-old child, and she talked to her about everything. Talked to her, the five-year-old, about everything. And five-year-olds are all about living in the moment. So they got no problem with that. And they, they experience utter despair, and they cry, and 30 seconds later, they're out chasing their dog, right? So maybe that's not too young for some kids. I don't know. I suspect 20 is too young for some people. It seems to me, though, the older we get, the, the, the greater is our inability to live in the moment. 
Whereas youngsters live in the moment, we live in a rut. You get older and it's hard to imagine that this set of living arrangements could ever end, much less that our lives would be different than they are now. So I get the most pushback, interestingly enough, from people my age and older. When I speak to college students and high school students, they haven't been fully indoctrinated yet. So it's easier for them to imagine a world in which they die than it is for people who are 50. Their careers. I know. I know, I understand that. I feel like I'm right at the brink of experiences and what I want. Don't we all feel like that? And this is why I don't think women should be able, allowed to marry until they're postmenopausal, because they really don't know themselves yet. It solves all kinds of problems at one time. <laughs> Oddly, no presidents are asking me to come on board as a policy advisor. It's wacky. No, I mean, as we get older, we actually mature, and we figure out that there are things that we want and things that we don't want, and, they don't, and, and our happiness, whatever that is, has little to do with the material possessions we've accumulated and, and more to do with those moments we've experienced with other human beings and even with non-human beings in nature. So to answer your question, I don't have the slightest idea. I don't know when I should tell myself. I'm a mere child, too, in my dreams. Somebody had a hand up over here. All the way in the back. In 2002, I was working on a book about climate change, and I realized that we had triggered human extinction probably by 2030 or so. And this is long before there were any major scientific assessments of the climate situation. It was long before anybody predicted one degree C by the end of the century. But I connected a few dots and it looked like things were looking pretty bad. And, <clears throat> and I mourned for months to the bemused curiosity of the three people who noticed. <laughs> because it's also theoretical, right? It's also, yeah, all humans are going to die, big deal. Right? It's, there's, it's not an individual that you know. No, it's every individual I know. And all of them I don't, too. But it's hard for people to, to get there, unless it's very personal. And then shortly after that, I discovered the concept of global peak oil and thought that it would terminate industrial civilization in time to give us a few more generations. But... That was a long time ago. We've triggered all those self-reinforcing feedback loops. The balls are still in the air with industrial civilization. The debt ceiling crisis is over. We're going to keep on going and going and going and guaranteeing near-term human extinction. And finally, the sciences are catching up as of three and a half years ago. And, but I held out. I held out hope for a really long time. And then it was June 20th, 2012, that I wrote the essay for which I've become famous or infamous in the literature as the, as the primary proponent of near-term human extinction. So it was a re-realization for me because I'd been there once before and I'd gone through the whole Kubler-Ross five stages of grief once before only to come back and get to do it over again 10 years later. It wasn't any easier the second time. I'm asked that a lot. What's that? I would say this perspective. Right. So I, I get asked that a lot. Usually the question goes, why? Why would you do this? Why would you, why would you present this horrible information to people who are just having a good day? <laughs> and it's a legitimate question. And so I have, I have what I think are a couple of gifts. I'm reminding you that you're mortal and that you might want to live accordingly, no matter how much time we have left. It's, it's good to be reminded of that because this culture steers us completely away from thinking about that. We never have the conversation. My parents are in their mid-70s. They don't even have a will because our culture says you're never going to die. So 
So initially, I thought that was my gift, was to remind you that you're going to die and that you might want to live in the moment and that whole thing. And then it occurs to me that the perhaps the greater gift is how we act when we're given a certain amount of time to die. So when a medical when a medical doctor knows that somebody has cancer and they have weeks or months to live in their professional opinion, it's malpractice if they don't tell that, if they don't reveal that. That's malpractice. Doctors are supposed to give us the facts, the information, and present their informed opinion about when we might reach the end of our days. And so I'm doing that. I think Bill, Bill McKibben and James Hansen and a whole bunch of other climate scientists are practicing our malpractice. They're guilty of malpractice because they know what I know. And almost every politician in the country knows what I know. All the leaders of the big banks know what I know. And they're lying to us. They aren't pre- and I'm just pre- presenting the information from other scientists here. I'm trying to the extent possible to not infuse my opinion in the situation. It's John Davies, who on September 20th, taking into account only carbon dioxide, says few people on the planet by 2040. It's Malcolm Light writing in, in February 2012, who assesses the methane situation, and so on. Yes, I agree with them, and that agreement is illustrated by me showing that information, but you're not going to find that information in the mainstream media. You're not going to find it in in government bulletins that arrive in your mailbox. You're going to be encouraged to go out and buy, buy, buy. Shop till you drop. Literally. I know that's a very unsatisfying response um, because I get the question repeatedly and apparently I haven't come up with an adequate response yet. Um, But that's where I am at this point. Mark, and then over here. All right. In the yellow shoes? Yeah. I spend every summer about 1,500 feet <clears throat> in the Rockies, and I make about 16, 17 degrees Celsius colder than you. Um, if, uh, would we survive up there if we could live on the natural the, uh, the birds? If the, if the herbs and the rabbits were there, but they won't be, at, at 4C above baseline, they won't be there. Because... <clears throat> well, I think that's an unsafe assumption. Plants can't move. They're sessile. So you work at Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Yes? No. Oh, no? Okay. No, I, I okay, okay. So the issue is not temperature per se, it's habitat. So when we, and we're already seeing this in some places, where where I lived for 23 years, Tucson, Arizona, there are citrus trees that are 100 years old. Two of the last four winters, dozens of citrus trees were killed by cold temperatures. They're 100 year old citrus trees, and they died in two of the last four winters because it became too cold for the first time in 100 years. Because the meandering jet stream is dragging cold temperatures down from the Arctic. The, the temperature gradient between the Arctic and the Amazon is breaking down, leading to this meandering jet stream. So we have extreme cold temperature events that kill plants. When it gets to 130 degrees, proteins denature in the plants, in almost all plants. There's a few plants in Death Valley that can survive and a few other places that can survive those temperatures. But most plants, especially plants that are living in places now where it only gets to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, will not survive when it gets to 125 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit. So in two days of an extreme temperature event, all the plants are dead. Then we get the dust bowl that never ends. So this is not about temperature per se, it's about habitat, and specifically about habitat, it's about food. It's our ability not only to grow crops for food, but also to gather the foods that we ate for the first two million years of the human experience. They just won't be there because they can't migrate fast enough. We're talking about extremely rapid temperature, 10 times faster than has occurred in the last 65 million years. There's no way for plants 
or animals to keep up with that, except the occasional birds. Yeah, here, there, and then up there. Um, right here. Oh, um, so I'm 22, so I guess I'm a young person, but I'm definitely in the thing here. Um, so I talk about this that I'm following, that we've been doing for the past like, six months. Um, I talk to a lot of other young people, and one of the, like, the pushback I get really way too often, way too often, um, is that don't worry, we'll be fine, we have technology, or we have internet, or globalization, like, we're connecting, like, humans from India, and we get all these, like, great ideas, don't worry. Tech fantasy. Yeah, like, the techno fantasy, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, well, okay, you believe that, and I can't, like, I can't really change your mind, it's like, it's a belief, so, I don't know, it's more of a comment. Yeah. yeah, no, that's right, that, uh, the techno fantasy that we will be able to tech our way out of this is absurd. You can't create habitat. You can't grow. It's, it, it, right now, it's relatively simple to grow food. It's getting increasingly difficult in most places because the weather's getting wacky. But technology is not going to produce food. We're, we're not, we, aren't, we aren't looking at a Star Trek world where Jean-Luc Picard walks up and says, tea, Earl Grey, hot, and it appears as if by magic. As if, we can't do that with cucumbers. And we aren't ever going to be able to do that with cucumbers. We're, we're facing a low energy world in the very near future. We're not going to, we're, the Jetsons' future is, is not ours with flying cars and that whole thing. Why would you say that? Would you just give up? Or would you say that? The Jetsons' future? Well, I don't know what to tell people who are captured by the techno fantasy. Um, for me, for the most part, it's a self-selecting process, right? I preach to the choir because that's who shows up. That's who always shows up is the choir. So that's who everybody preaches to. And, and it doesn't take long in casual conversation before people either turn me off or come up with some techno fantasy. I'm hoping somebody can come up with a real answer. You don't want to be sitting next to me on the plane. This is a true story from yesterday. This poor woman is sitting beside me on the plane. And she makes the unfortunate mistake of asking me if I want to read the newspaper. <laughs> well, obviously, that's stupid. Because I flip through the newspaper, and I say, look at that. The most important news in the world is didn't make the newspaper. And then she doubles down in stupid. <laughs> and she says, really? What's the most important news in the world? <laughs> well, you're sorry you asked. <laughs> and so I tell her. And she doesn't go to techno fantasy. She goes to her religion to her religious belief, and she tells me that God won't let that happen. And I say, really? So when God comes back and looks at what we've done with the place, you think he's going to be pretty impressed? <laughs> and I'm in the aisle seat. <laughs> She's got nowhere to go. You know, but she was suddenly really interested in the window. I, I don't know what to tell people, so I just tell them everything I know, and nobody's happy about it. You know, <laughs> We don't present people with a gradient of impact that they affect when they take environmental action. There's too much of a Super Bowl uh, concept. Of, you've got to either say the whole thing or not. Whereas, in fact, one of your videos of Dr. and David Roberts totally depressed me. And I stopped performing for a while in Pearl Street and at university until I came up with a concept that worked for me. And that so I gave you a vacation. You did give me a vacation. <laughs> But uh, we've got it a little bit more. <laughs> and the thing that finally, because of you, I had to come up with is a concept called the green butterfly. And that is, whenever we, whenever I leave my home, I imagine I grab a whole bunch of green butterflies and put it in my pocket. And then every time I take environmental action, I let one go very dramatically, knowing that somewhere it'll save a little bit of habitat because our actions take some action. Mm -hmm. And so many people that I talk to, they say, hey, it's going to go down anyway. We're losing it all. But we're not telling people somewhere there is a little world, a small, small world that we're saving. There's this Super Bowl concept of winning everything. No, we've got to remember that, that every action we take is going to help save little lovers, be they grasshopper lovers or ant lovers or human lovers. 
some wear, but this then occasionally make it uh, work is the butterfly effect might actually save a whole hurricane from hitting a town like Joplin or save a country. So that has got me out of the uh, McPherson's uh, doldrums. <laughs> There's a whole syndrome named after me. I love that. We should contact the Journal of American Medical Association. That's a great, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful story. Thanks for sharing that. And that's right. And I promote resistance against this omnicidal culture, not in the hope that it'll save our species, but in the hope it'll save other species. Because as E.O. Wilson, the biologist at Harvard points out, it only takes 10 million years after a great extinction event, before you have a, a blossoming, full, rich planet again. That's what we're working toward, is saving habitat for other species at this point. I couldn't agree more. What do we have? What have we always had? What we have is we can live. We can live now. We can live here now. That's what we've always had. And so what you're suggesting is to act now towards a better future, even if that future is only the day after tomorrow. There are a thousand children a day die early deaths as a result of climate change. No, they're not in this country. They're in sub-Saharan Africa. So you never heard about it in the news. We can make things better for tomorrow, for those thousand children a day who would die tomorrow if we do some things differently today. So yes, it's all about the moment and the moments we have and the moments we remember, the moments we live. So let's live here now with the other human beings and organisms that we're sharing this wonderful planet with. Yeah. Okay, um, I can't help but wonder, I mean, is your presentation over? Because you give statistical information as to showing that um, the climate crisis and the environmental crisis is happening. How are you failed to mention one of the most important parts, which is why? Why is it happening? It's not just happening out of the clear blue sky. So, and, and you failed to mention why and what would be a, how could we um, stop it? And, and um, that would in itself would be a, an argument against, um, I would say, a technological fantasy or religion. And that capitalism, capitalism is causing this. How are you failing to mention that? I mean, I, you give statistical information, but so what? I mean, why is, it, why is this happening? I would go deeper to the root than that. It's not merely capitalism, it's socialism too. It's every ism you want. It's civilization. It's civilization. The first civilizations arose a few thousand years ago, seven of them simultaneously on different continents. And at that moment, civilization became a cul-de-sac. It became a death trap. It became a patriarchal set of living arrangements that drove us into human population overshoot. And civilization was a cul-de-sac, but it wasn't a one-way street. In fact, there are at least three cultures, the Mimbris, the Olmec, and the Chaco, that when civilization failed, and here I'll use the example of the Mimbris near where I live, the Mimbris gained access to a cheap energy source known as maize or corn nearly a thousand years ago after having lived in the area for about 10,000 years. And within 20 years, they were so deep in human population overshoot, 
and then they had a drought, and they ate the seed cone, they ate the seed corn. Twenty years after they began civilization by growing grains, they collapsed catastrophically, and a few survivors walked away. And the survivors that came back didn't do corn ever again. They didn't do civilization. They didn't store grains to get them through the hard times. Civilization is not a one-way street. The Olmec did the same thing. The Membres, the Chaco, all these cultures collapsed. And when they returned from that, they went back to hunting and gathering, not to civilization. Industrial civilization is a one-way street. Industrial civilization, we can't go back anymore since 1939, since we invented nuclear Armageddon. There's no one going back. If we cease this set of living arrangements at this point, the world's 400 and some nuclear power plants melt down catastrophically and we're all dead in, in a month. So we can't terminate industrial civilization until we shut down the nuclear power plants. It takes at least 20 years to decommission a nuclear power plant. There was a panel in New York City last weekend, which included the recent ex-head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in this country. And they concluded that it would take at least 60 years to decommission Indian Point, the nuclear power plant right outside of New York City. At least 60 years. So we can't see civilization that is making us fat, making us sick, and killing us. Because if we do, we're all dead in a short period of time. Consider, for example, Fukushima Daiichi. At Fukushima Daiichi, they're going to move, try to move the 1,223 spent fuel rods from the pools five stories above ground in, in a pool of water. They're going to try to move those next month. TEPCO, the unbelievably incompetent organization, TEPCO, is going to try to move those. And they're all broken. And they don't have a, a, a decent tool to move them with. According to Christine Consola, nuclear re researcher and activist, if one of the MOX fuel rods is exposed to the air, one, it will kill 2.89 billion people in a matter of a week or so. You breathe in five to 10 micrograms of plutonium from the atmosphere, you're dead in a week. So we can't reverse industrial civilization at this point. It took me a long time to figure that out. So we have to maintain industrial civilization, which is killing us through climate change. So getting at the root, it's all about civilization, and it's a trap. And at this point, it's a one-way street. It's a trap, and we're already caught. There's no escape. Yeah. Um, I'm a writer in the outdoor industry, a journalist. <clears throat> No, I just heard about it for the first time. Okay. Uh, well, Patagonia knew about it, and they shot it down because they're not the way. And they went to Pat instead. So, um, we've had the ability to do textiles, synthetic, scalable textiles, out of crops. But the problem with possible the solution that you know, we start pulling this carbon out of that atmosphere and making stuff. Um, that's not a conversation that goes anywhere. And uh, it's really interesting to me. The reason that PLA got shot down was because of GMO and because of its how GMO in the food supply is contaminating this feedstock or textile and how that would make it so people who had an ethical problem with GMO couldn't buy into the textiles because those were genetically modified textiles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, and it makes no sense, just like the rest of this culture. Well, when I hear that there's no solution, that there's really no hope, um, but then you say take action. Well, I decided to take action by getting interested in this one solution for 
Well, that's kind of disturbing to me. yes, that's right. Hope, as Nietzsche pointed out, is the worst of evils, for it extends the torments of man. And were he not such a misogynist, I'm sure he would have included women in there too. Each one has no agency. Let's take agency instead. Let's not hope that somebody will make it better. Let's act instead. I'm not suggesting that we can prevent human extinction but we never could, because organisms go extinct, including ours. I'm not even suggesting we can prevent near-term extinction of humans in the near term, in, in a matter of a few decades, or maybe even one. I'm still suggesting that we take action. Action is the an antidote to despair, after all. Uh, will, it, will it work? There's, there's no guarantees. The only thing that... that is guaranteed to fail as if we don't act. I, you know, Pandora and I never really hit it off. So that's what, was, that's what was left in the vessel known as Pandora's box after everything else escaped was hope. So I don't know. People are starting to trickle out and lose interest, and I want Jenny to be able to make an announcement, and I will stay here for as long as anybody would like to talk one-on-one. -on -one. What's that? How accommodating of you. <laughs> Thank you.